So previously on this channel, we talked about the animal weapons and we talked about the Zodiac weapons. Today, I'm happy to inform you that I have finally gotten my first Eureka Relic. Hello and welcome back guys to the Big Blue Purple channel. In this video, I'd like to go over my experience with Eureka in 2023, what it's like from start to finish. I'm going to talk about the Relic weapon, I'm going to talk about the Elemental Armor, and I'm also going to talk about the Baldessian Arsenal and the Ozma Mount that you can get from that. Eureka is without a doubt the most time-consuming relic I've ever done, even more so than the Zodiac weapon, but at the same time, it's absolutely been the most fun relic weapon grind I've ever done, and it's nothing like the other ones. Before we get into the video, I just want to say that this is by no means a guide for a Eureka relic, but rather a look at what it's like to go through Eureka in 2023, and my overall thoughts on the experience of Eureka, as well as the Baldessian Arsenal. So without further ado, let's talk about Eureka, starting with the first zone, Animos. So starting out in Eureka is without a doubt the hardest part in my opinion. It's so overwhelming going into Eureka for the first time because it's just nothing like any other content in the game other than Bajja of course if you've done that, but even Bajja is much different than Eureka in many ways. Animos is honestly a very strong start to Eureka. The zone is cool looking, the enemies are well placed and not oversaturated in certain zones, and it introduces you well to the unique mechanics of Eureka, such as the elemental affinities and the Magia board. In case you don't already know, the enemies in Eureka have a specific elemental affinity that you can see next to their name. This basically tells you what element they are, and you can use your Magia board to give yourself either an offensive or defensive bonus against these enemies. Unless you're a tank, you will always, always, always be giving yourself the offensive bonus. You're going to place all of the Magicite you get into that offensive bonus, and you're just going to rotate it around to whatever the element of the enemy is. For your first few levels, you just go around killing enemies around the same level as you and doing your challenge log as best as you can until you're high enough level to start joining up some NM trains. NMs are the fates in Eureka, essentially, but rather than being like pretty fucking boring ad clear fates, there are actually some pretty sick boss fights that you get to get in this huge group of like 30 people and just fuck up this one boss. It's a fun time and it's a very communitive experience. Right off the bat here, Eureka establishes itself as a very different type of content than the rest of the game. Not only do you need other people to help you fight these NMs, but it's a very group oriented content in many ways. You need to actually spawn these NMs by farming a specific type of enemy as a group and working together can really, really speed this up. The Eureka community is also very nice and considerate to the other players in the instance. They don't instantly pull the fates as they spawn. They will say in shout chat what time they plan to pull the boss. And if you need an extension, you can shout in chat, hey, please wait, I'm on the way. And they will wait for you all the time, pretty much, until you get to Pyros and Hydatas, and we will talk about that. At least on the Ether data center, there is some issues in Pyros and Hydatas. We will get to that later. Animos though as a zone is very very relaxed and people there are super nice and helpful to the new players just getting started in Eureka. To be honest with you guys, Animos is the zone that I have the least to say about because it's just so straightforward. You, you get introduced to all these new Eureka mechanics and it can seem overwhelming at first, but as soon as you get the flow of the gameplay down where it's like do your challenge log and join the NM train, then that's it really. That's all you need to do in Eureka. One important thing to mention though, is that if you die in Eureka and you respawn, you will de-level. You will level down if you die and respawn. This is why you'll see in chat if you go into Eureka, people will shout in chat their position and say, hey, I need a res here, please come get me. It's because they don't want to de-level. And the whole community is very accepting of that. They all make sure to res people as much as they can to avoid anyone de-leveling. So I've given a bit of an overview of what Eureka looks like as a new player, but what about the Relic Weapon itself? For many people, that's the reason they come in here in the first place. How do you get the Relic Weapon? Where do you start? So when you complete Notorious Monster Fates, you actually get Animos Crystals, and you can go over to Geralt and trade your Animos Crystals in for Protean Crystals. You can then trade those Protean Crystals in to upgrade your weapon. I believe you'll need around 1300 Protean Crystals to complete the Relic in Animos, and you'll also need 3 Pazuzu Feathers. These will drop from the Pazuzu Fate, it's a level 20 Fate that will spawn, or an NM rather. 
uh, and you just need to get three of those. You can also buy them with Protean Crystals. So if the Pazuzu Fate is not up and it's not spawning, then you can just grind a bunch of other ones until you get enough Protean Crystals to actually just buy the Pazuzu Feathers. This is what I had to do. But yeah, that's Animos pretty much. It's definitely the most straightforward zone. The most confusing part about it is just learning all the nuances of Eureka since it's brand new content and it has its own rules and whatnot. But Animos is super straightforward and I think the hardest part of it, honestly, is just leveling 220. Other than that, I've gone back and gotten enough Protean Crystals to make another Animos Relic in like under an hour. It's so easy. My advice to you, if you're planning to try Animos, is to rush to level 9 using your challenge log. This will allow you to attune to all the Aetherites in the zone, which is very important for NM trains. And then just start joining the NM trains and getting EXP that way, because that way you're collecting crystals and XP rather than just killing mobs for challenge log. So coming out of Animos, I was actually enjoying Eureka a lot and looking forward to the second zone. Of course, if you've played Eureka before, you know that Pagos is an absolute shithole. I actually hated Pagos so much that I stopped playing Eureka entirely, went and did an ultimate raid in Party Finder, and then came back like a month later to give Pagos another shot. Yes, doing ultimate in the Party Finder is more fun than Pagos, mark my fucking words. Compared to Animos, the leveling just takes such a nosedive in Pagos. It takes so much longer to level up in this zone. If you don't have your challenge log ready when you get here, have fun grinding your way up to level 25 so you can use all the etherites. Also, the enemy density in this zone makes Dark Souls 2 look like it's well designed. It's insane to me how many enemies they shove into every little tiny corner of the map. If you aggro one of them, the other 36 of them are going to aggro to you and fucking destroy you, man. I encourage you when you get to this zone and you're trying to level to 25 so you can get all those etherites, party up with people around your level within like one to two levels of you and just go farm mobs because it is going to be absolute hell if you try to solo farm your way like I did to level 25. It fucking sucks and it makes this zone way more tedious than it ever needs to be. Now let's talk about another part of Pagos that's absolute dog shit. So essentially when you hit level 25, you're gonna get a kettle from Geralt, and you can fill this kettle with light. You need to get a certain amount of crystals from this kettle. But how do you turn the light you get into crystals? Well, where I'm going on screen right now is how you get to the crystal forge in Pagos. You need to drop off the side of this cliff there's going to be a sleeping dragon, okay, down at this cliff. To get past him, you need to walk. Before you get into this zone, make sure you know what your walk key is, because if you don't, you're going to fucking die. I know I did. Before Pagos, I literally didn't even know that there was a walk key, so hey, you learn something new every day in Eureka. So nine crystals is the cap before you have to come down here and turn them in to actually get the crystals. Otherwise, your light bar will fill up, but you won't be able to fill it anymore, and you'll be wasting crystals, of course. Why does this system exist? Fuck if I know, dude. This is such a stupid concept, and I don't think anyone enjoys it. And thankfully, they learned their lessons going into Pyrus and Hydatos, because you never have to do this again. Otherwise, in terms of, like, getting the relic here, it's pretty much the exact same process of Animos, but with some extra steps. Like I mentioned, you need to go to that Crystal Forge and get your Frosted Protean Crystals that way, but then you also need to get the Pagos Crystals with Drop from the Fates and turn those in to upgrade your weapons. And then at the very end, for the last step, instead of Pazuzu Feathers, which you need in Animos, you're going to need Louie Ice from the Louie boss. This is a level 35 boss, and you need to be at least level 34 to get the rewards from it. So make sure that you are grinding those levels as fast as you can before this fate pops. My advice to you, if you're planning to do Eureka and Pagos looks like dog shit because it is, do it as fast as you goddamn can. Just blow through it. Doesn't matter how painful it is. Doesn't matter how much it sucks. I made the mistake of taking a one month break from Eureka because I hated this zone so much, when in reality, you can probably finish all of Pagos within about 12 hours of gameplay. So just push it, push through it, get through Pagos, and Eureka gets so much better from here, I assure you.
Moving on to Eureka Pyros. This is without a doubt the fastest zone in all of Eureka. This one took me the least amount of time. Leveling here is super fast thanks to Logos actions. And the zone as a whole is just so much more enjoyable than Pagos. Pyros is also a great opportunity to make some gill if you're interested in that. The bunny fates here, there's going to be these bunny fates. They're on the map all the time. Pagos had them too, but they're irrelevant in Pagos. Basically, if you do these bunny fates, they'll lead you to a chest, and that chest could have something worth millions of gil. The mount I got from one of my chests, the Elder's Mount, was worth like 4 million gil on the market board. I kept it for myself though, because I don't care about gil that much. Now, making gil in Eureka is wonderful and all, but it also causes some problems when it comes to NMs in this zone. The main issue with Pyros is the absolute infestation of insta-pullers. So, if we go back to the previous zones, Pagos and Animos, people will wait and set a time in chat for when they're gonna pull NMs. That way, if people aren't at the NM yet, but they want the EXP and the rewards, they have time to get over there. They can say in chat, like, hey, I'm on the way, please give me an extension, I will be there. And everyone will wait for them because it's a community, people are nice in Eureka, and everything is great. Until we hit Pyros. Basically, there is three NMs in Pyros that drop an item that sells for a lot of gil. This is because these items can be combined to give you a sixth magicite. You're capped at five magicites in Eureka, but in Pyros you can get a sixth, and in Hydatos you can get a seventh, which is cool but highly unnecessary. There's three bosses in Pyros that will drop a magicite related item that sells for millions on the market board. These bosses are Skull, Lambrix, and Ying Yang, I believe he's called. Those three will all drop an item or have a chance of dropping an item that is worth millions if you sell it on the market board. Now, this is a bit of a trap, at least on my data center, Gilgamesh, or on my server, Gilgamesh, because if I look at the sale history for these items, they sell like once a month, if even. So I don't really know what the hype is, but this is enough of a reason for people not to wait for you to get there. As soon as those fates are up, they are being pulled. At least in my experience on Ether, this is what happens every time. It's so bad that you will start to recognize the people who insta-pull. I'll never forget when uh, some guy in my party, we were just grinding NMs together, was like, oh, this person's in the instance, get ready for everything to be insta-pulled. And I was like, what? You know them by name at this point? Yeah, that's how bad Pyros can get with some of these people. Outside of those three NMs though that get insta-pulled all the time, Pyros is such a fantastic zone in comparison to Pagos. Yes, the sleeping dragons are back, but guess what? You could just run past them now. You can walk around the dragon instead of having to like slow walk right through it. It's so much better in this zone with the sleeping dragons and they're basically inconsequential here. Leveling is also insanely fast in this zone thanks to Logos actions, something new in Eureka Pyros. If you've played um, Bajja, then you'd be familiar with what Logos actions basically are already with the essences in Bajja. But for a quick rundown, Logos actions are essentially these actions that will allow you to do something that is kind of overpowered and typically you wouldn't be able to do. You can get a res on every job, even if you're not a healer, you can res people as samurai for God's sake. But the main Logos action we want to talk about is something called Reflect. It's a Logos action that will deflect all magic spells back at the caster. What this means is that you can go to enemies like 5, 6, 7 levels higher than you, cast Reflect, and kill them in a matter of a few hits because of how much damage they would be doing to you. You can even speed this up by taking all your armor off, but this is very risky because if you mess up your Reflect, if you get hit, you are 100% dead and you're gonna have to ask for a res. Reflect farming is actually really fun though, and it levels you up mad quick. I would estimate you could probably reach max level within a couple of hours if you get some good reflect farming spots going. And max level for Pyros is 50 by the way, in Pagos it was 35, I don't think I mentioned that, but yeah, it's 50 in Pyros. The armor that you may want, the elemental glowy armor, is also from Pyros, at least the non-glowy version, but you have to get that to get the glowy version. So. To get that, you need to get all 50 of the logo actions that you can get within Pyros. To do this, just look up what all the recipes are for the logograms. 
And then I recommend just buying all that shit off the market board because it's honestly really cheap nowadays and it's it's way easier than grinding out all those logo grams yourself. As for actually doing the relic in this zone, you'll need a total of 650 Pyros Crystals. This is not too too bad to get and you'll get it pretty quickly, especially if you farm levels with the uh, Reflect. By the time you start doing NMs, you'll already be max level, so you'll be able to get crystals from every single NM like, because you'll be of level for all of them. You'll also have to get five of the Penthesilia's Flames, I believe they're called. These drop from the Penthesilia boss, which is the like max level fate in this zone. So make sure you hit that every time it's up. You'll only need to kill her twice because she drops three Penthesilia's Flames each time she dies. If you want to get the armor as well, you'll have to get the non-glowy armor in this zone. Like I said, you'll first have to get all of your Logos actions, which you'll need to be working on anyway for the weapon. And after you've done that, you'll just need 200 Pyros Crystals. So in total, for this entire zone, if you want to get everything, you will need 850 Pyros Crystals. I estimate that this zone took around 10 hours for me to do in total, and it was without a doubt the least painful area in all of Eureka. It went super smoothly, the Logos actions breathed new life into Eureka that made it exciting again, and the people insta-pulling bosses at least kept you on your toes if nothing else. Hydatos is the fourth and final Eureka Zone, and it is also home to the Baldessian Arsenal, a 56-man raid that awards the Demi Ozma mount. We will talk about that in a bit. Hydatos itself is probably the easiest zone in terms of like leveling up and navigating. It's a completely flat map, and it's super, super easy to navigate. There's no sleeping dragons this time around you have to deal with, and the enemy density is pretty standard at this point. It's not nearly as bad as I think Pagos is. You can also reflect farm here like you did in Pyros if you want to speed through those levels. But when I got to Hydatos, I was already level 53. So I just decided to join the NM train right off the bat and level with that. Because at least you can pick up some crystals in advance when you're in the NM train. And crystals are the main concern when it comes to Hydatos. This area is very painless in every faucet, except for the crystals. The most amount of crystals you are going to get from any NM, from the highest level NM zone in the zone, the most you can get is 10. The only exception to this is that if somebody is running BA, if there's a team doing the Baldessian Arsenal while you're in the instance and you're not doing it, there'll be a support fate outside of the Baldessian Arsenal that awards 30 crystals. This is the most crystals you'll be able to get in the entire zone from a singular fate. Well, since the crystal yield is so low, we only need a couple hundred crystals, right? Surely it won't be so bad. Not exactly. For the weapon alone, you need 350 Hydatos crystals, which in turn would equate to 35 fates that give you 10 crystals. Not even, not even to mention all the fates that don't even give you 10 crystals. I believe there's only two that give you 10 crystals, being Avni and um, Providence Watcher. So just for the weapon alone, you're looking at 35 Provenance Watchers slash Omni kills. If you want the armor as well, the glowy elemental armor, which was pretty much the whole reason I even came in here if I'm being honest, that is another 200 crystals you're going to need on top of the 350 for the weapon, meaning you will need a total of 55 Provenance Watcher slash Omni kills. That might be a bit of a weird way to gauge it, but you get what I mean. Hydatos took me anywhere from 14 to 20 hours to get all the crystals. To be honest with you, I don't know the exact numbers, but it felt like I spent the most time in Hydatos by far out of any zone. The insta-pulling problem from Pyros comes straight into Hydatos because there are yet another three bosses that will drop parts worth some good gil. If you're interested in getting those parts, then you better be there when the fucking NM spawn because if you're not, some motherfucker is gonna pull that boss instantly because he's a piece of shit. I've heard that this is only an ether problem anyway though, or maybe just an NA problem. So if you're in JP or EU servers, I highly doubt this is even gonna be an issue with the insta-pulling. Otherwise, just buckle up and have fun grinding fates in this zone because you'll be doing it for a long ass time. 
there's really nothing else to talk about here other than the existence of six new Logos actions that will bring it up to a total of 56 Logos actions. And if you want to complete your elemental armor, you have to get the final six, but that's no big deal. It takes no time at all. Just go to the market board and spend a bit of gil. So the last thing I want to talk about for Eureka now, and potentially my favorite part of Eureka as a whole, is the Baldessian Arsenal. Like I mentioned earlier, this is a 56-man activity, and there is no matchmaking for this. You need to find a Discord server to get yourself a run organized. Thankfully, the Discord community around setting up a BA run is super great, and it's not a hassle at all. When I heard that you had to go into this Discord and you had to join a voice chat and listen to callouts and all this bullshit, I was like, man, that sounds like a huge pain in the ass. But it's incredibly simple, the people running it are super friendly, and when you yourself join the run, there's no communication on your end, you just need to listen to the callouts so you don't get hit by shit. Also, BA is the only content in the game where I've ever gotten a warning message before unlocking it that's like, yeah bro, so this shit is hard by the way, make sure you're prepared. Not even Savage or Ultimate gives you a warning like that. Realistically though, in terms of difficulty, I'd say BA is probably just a little bit harder than an Alliance raid, and it's not because mechanically it's complex, but because it's insanely punishing in comparison to anything else. Apart from a few exceptions, death is permanent in BA, and if you die, you're not going to get the clear. There's also a mechanic in the final boss that can literally suck you out of the raid if you do it wrong, and send you back just into Hydatos. The only two ways you could possibly be revived here if you die are through the personal Logos action, which is called Spirit of the Remembered. This one gives you a flat 70% chance of being revived if you die. Basically, you just gotta pray that that procs. Because if not, a healer has to also use Spirit of the Remembered, and then use the healer exclusive Logos action called Sacrifice, which allows them to kill themselves to save you, in hopes that their 70% procs and saves them as well. So basically, just don't die. Thankfully though, this is the only real difficulty in BA, because you have people doing callouts for you on Discord. You don't even need to watch a guide, I know I didn't, I didn't even watch anything going into this, I was kinda blind. And because they just call out everything before it happens, there's not really any difficulty in dodging these mechanics, you have plenty of time to dodge between when they call it out and when it happens. And I just want to say, if someone from the Discord happens to stumble upon this video, thank you guys for all that you do. I don't think this content would be alive anymore if it weren't for that kind of support. In terms of the raid itself and what I thought of it, I think it's a really fun time. It's kind of like a slightly harder version of an alliance raid combined with the mechanics of a deep dungeon. This is a very unique piece of content and it's nothing like anything else I've done in this game, so I really appreciate it for that. It is definitely a very large time investment though in comparison to like your average alliance raid. I think it takes about an hour and a half to get everything set up and, and go through the entire raid. So make sure you have some time to spare. I'd make sure you have two to three hours just in case something goes wrong. Because it's a very long experience, not just doing the raid, but also getting 56 players into the same instance, getting them all organized into their groups, and all that shit. The first three fights in the raid are pretty straightforward and I don't have a whole lot to say about them, as well as the fact that I have no footage of them because a bunch of my footage got corrupt. I had a full hard drive when I was doing this raid, had no idea, and then when I was trying to clip things with shadow play, I kept getting like really short clips. It's because my hard drive was running out of space, and now this is all the footage that I have. I'm so glad I have this specific part you're seeing now though, because you see someone drop that meteor right on the whole party. If this tank did an LB3, we're, we're all dead. None of us are getting them out in the last like 10% of his HP because that one dude put a meteor on the whole party. Shout out the tank who LB3'd. That was an insane moment. Ozma is like a much harder boss than your average alliance raid boss. He has tells, but those tells are insanely specific. And if you didn't watch a guide before coming in and you don't have shot callers, you'd have no idea what to do or where to stand. I wouldn't call him extreme in difficulty, but he borders on the line of it. Again, it all just comes down to how punishing this raid is. If you die, you're done. That's it. You're not getting your mount. You're not getting your clear. You're finished. 
thankfully though, with the way the Discord is organized and set up, you should have no problem getting your clear on your first attempt. I didn't watch a guide. I had like no information ahead of time and I got my clear first try, no deaths, and it was super clean. BA to me is like the reward at the end of all the grinding you've been through. You get a really cool raid that you can only experience after you've done all that Eureka grinding. I totally recommend this to anyone who's gotten to Hydatos but is maybe a little bit turned off or afraid by the fact that they have to join a huge Discord call. Just do it. I assure you, it is not stressful at all. People are incredibly helpful and nice and the callouts are super concise and easy to understand, you'll have no problem getting that clear. And that's pretty much all I want to say about Eureka. There is so much to talk about with this content, and that's why this video has ended up being so long. There's tons of specifics I could get into with all the gill farming you can do, and all the extra stuff you can worry about other than relics, because Eureka is kind of its own game mode within the game, and it's something really special if you're interested in that. Just like other parts of the game though, like Deep Dungeon or Bajja, this isn't going to be for everyone and you might not enjoy it, but I encourage you to at least give Animos a shot, get to around level 9 so you can join the Fate Train, and see if you like the process of grouping up and running NMs with other people. I think the huge community experience of Eureka is what makes it stand out so much. This content is still so alive despite being as old as it is. You know, I remember that being a major concern for me before I went for this relic. I'd hear people say like, oh man, Eureka's gonna be dead after Endwalker. Like, no one's doing Eureka anymore. Trust me, everybody is still doing Eureka. It is rare, like, only at the most absurd hours of morning, like 2, 3 a.m., did I find dead Eureka instances. At like evening, like 6 p.m. to like midnight, holy shit, Eureka is popping. It is always popping. Get in there, grind your NMs, meet some friendly people. It is a great time, I assure you. Otherwise, thanks for sticking around this long if you made it this far. Hopefully this made some decent content to listen to while you're doing your MSQ roulette or whatever. I know that's when I watch the most 14 content. Remember to like the video, but only if you did, and subscribe to the channel if you're interested in hearing more of my 14 experiences in the future. Now go give Eureka a fair shot, because I'm telling you, it's a lot more fun than people made it out to be.